Well, I thought we would talk about, uh, begin to think about this book as uh, thinking about literacies and the various literacies that, that people learn and that they, or that they are developing on their own. And that we would talk about these in, in uh, ways that, that might help us begin to see perhaps uh, one of the one of the messages, one of the perspectives that Dickens is trying to give us on social systems and also perhaps on spirituality. Um, I wrote my graduate study um, uh, thesis, my dissertation on, on baptism and regeneration in our mutual friend. And regeneration was an, an interesting topic for the Victorians. In 2022, it seems unlikely that a topic of church doctrine, fairly complicated church doctrine, would become dinner table conversations for, for people in especially London, but in the country as well. And they did. The whole notion of how one was regenerate uh, and baptism was a, it was a big deal you know, to the Victorians. And we, don't, we, have to, we can't miss, can't miss the fact that Noddy Boffin's name, what does Noddy stand for? Not somebody who's sleeping. Or what is this? <laughs> Nicodemus. And, and, if, and one of the other things to keep in mind is even though they were becoming very secular, the Victorians knew the Bible. And as J. Hillis Miller said, they were, they may have been pieces of dry toast spiritually, but they were, they were, they were in a soup of religion uh, that, they, that they knew well. And, and it, was, it was an environmental element of their, of their lives that defined things for them. And Nicodemus, of course, is the character in the New Testament. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. And he comes to Jesus, this upstart Nazarene prophet, in the middle of the night. And he comes to ask him a question. And the question basically is, what must I do to be saved? And we can look at our mutual friend, I think, in many perspectives. And the one we don't want to leave out, we can look at it economically uh, with the dust, the, the, uh, taking the discussion of the uh, British working class and the poor and the dust heaps and the city <coughs> and the rising and the rising uh, uh, upstart materialist class that had no 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 name no history of name they just appeared as the veneerings do and they multiplied and encouraged one another so we have that at the same time though we have another sub, subplot running, just as we had the subplots in our mutual friend road running. So I thought we might think about these as literacies. How do I, how do I function or can I function? Can I be literate uh, in, in a world that is layered, in a world that appears to be uh, without sympathy, without empathy, I think in a world that appears to be deadly in its competition, in a world that seems to be lost in what the, the purpose, this purpose of self is. And then perhaps next time we can talk a little bit more about, about the whole notion of regeneration. We have to remember that the center of the plot though comes the center of the whole plot is, of course, the mystery of John Harmon. And John Harmon nearly drowns, but not quite. He comes out of the river, and what does he do? He takes another name. Actually, many of them, many identities. 
And so we have the we have an interesting uh, interesting combination of economics, uh, social systems, human development, and all in this. How can I make myself? How can I make myself? Uh, how can I make myself happy? What must I do to be saved? Now, that's that's a tricky thing because Charles Dickens was not a doctrinal Christian by any means. If you don't believe that, just simply read his Life of Our Lord, which was not published until the 20th century, because that's complete heresy from a from a strictly <laughs> doctrinal position. So, so anyway, let, how about we get started and see what what we might get be doing here. So we said hello. Now let's think of some of the patterns. We'll start by thinking of patterns. It's always easier, or at least it's easier for me if I begin to see threads starting. Uh, I have to be careful with that, that I don't uh, confuse one moment with a thread, but this is certainly, uh, we've read lots of Dickens novels and we know that there are threads that go, that tangle up and then untangle and tangle up and untangle uh, in the novels. And then perhaps we can look more care carefully at characters, look a little bit at language, okay? Catching some lines, okay? And see what those lines, see what we can pull in with those lines. And, uh, and then whatever else we want to talk about. So does that seem to be okay with everybody? Shall we try that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so let's think about patterns. And I have, have just a few. We can look at reflections. Um, we can look at couples. Okay, we've got, we can look at the picking of the dust and we can look at designing, all right? And then we'll, then we'll find out some others. So if we thought about reflections, we have to remember that reflection is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, an, a verb and it's also a noun. So if we think about reflections, we can think about mirrors. So if you think about the mirrors, let's think not just about the veneering's mirror, but how, how do characters reflect one another? Or how do they stop being reflected by one another? Anybody want to start us off with that idea? Uh, I, this is Phyllis. Um, yeah. uh, uh, I just was going over this again quickly this morning. One scene that has a wonderful mirror scene in it is the Lemleys, yeah. um, where they, first of all, are distorting themselves to the world, right. and they can only communicate to one another looking at each other in the mirror. Yes, right. As right. if they cannot face the reality they are, I guess. Right. Um, right. And speaking of the biblical thing, the Mephistophelian uh, flavor of um, fire and brimstone that surround um, Alfred uh, is never far from it. And then we have the cherubic uh, father of Bella, um, uh, which is uh, also, and perhaps the most sympathetic portrayal of a clergyman I've read in the nine or 10 novels of Dickens I've read. Right. Um, with a wonderful, like one sentence summing up of what a good clergyman would be, you know, so. Yes. That's, that's my thoughts. I, well, I think that's a good box. Uh, you and uh, Jenny Rand are, are building us some good, some good pieces to, uh, to begin to add to. Anybody, this is just wonderful. You, you've suggested, of course, that as they speak to each other in the mirror. Okay. The other one that strikes me is when they're trying to get uh, Fledgeby and Georgiana to talk to each other. And so they're making up this conversation. Yes, yes, that is a great scene. I mean, and, and there, are, there are so many um, um, playwright or 
uh, dramaturgical references here too. People are always coming up to the mark or yeah. uh, the, the play now will close. I mean, and, and this was a perfect example of that, that they were literally puppeteers um, with these two. Yes, that was a great scene, yeah. 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 Um, so yes, well, I think, yes, then, and I had not thought about, uh, about adding Mephistopheles to the cherubs. We also, we also need to think about the cherubic Mr. Wilfer, but we need to think about, about little Johnny and the cherubic, cherubic children uh, in the hospital. Those are, those are more genuine cherubs. And, uh, and also, also when we think about Mephistopheles, we can think about Alfred, but we need to think about Bradley Headstone because he is so angry. Now he's not tempting anybody though. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure that's Mephistopheles, that may be someone else, okay, who's very angry. Okay. Um, one other thread that um, just yes. kept jumping up to me was, um, was friends, mm -hmm. um, and that's a whole subject, but also names and, um, and being from somewhere, obviously second chapter, uh, but names all the time come up. And in fact, I'm just thinking now of Bradley Headstone, now that you mention it, there's a line where Dickens is describing a squalid cemetery in the middle of the city where the headstones are above the living and are lying crookedly as if embarrassed by the lies they are telling. Yes. Um, right. So that would resonate, I think, with the headstone name. Right. Perhaps, I don't know. No, I, th I think that does. And that that helps us with the, uh, the whole notion of, of thoughts mirrored. In some cases, the thoughts are mirrored by, by the headstones people create for themselves or leave or lying flat um, as they are uh, labeling one of themselves, labeling one another of themselves. Yeah, great, great. Liam? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, I, I think more of, um, doubling and parallel, par say, kind of parallelism mm -hmm. um, than reflections, really. But one reflection might be, um, there's, there's, there's multiple questions about John Harmon's identity. Yes. I, I mean, not, not, there's no mystery for the reader. We know who John Harmon is. Um, but there are there's questions around his identity. And what one reflection, if, if that's the, the um, term you want to use, might even simply be the, the bloke who looks a bit like him and therefore tries to take advantage of him. To, uh, right. the, the, the guy who's attempted, whose name it leads me for the minute, is George something, isn't it? Redfoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, the fact that they've been mistaken for each other. Yeah. And the, the passage that come, where you find that out, where um, Rokesmith stroke Harmon is, is thinking through the right. events of what happened, and and it's a really it's a really interesting device to let the reader know what's happened because yeah. John Ro John Harmon as Ro John Harmon as Harmon, I guess, as himself yeah. is speaking right. to John Harmon as he, he he speak he's talking to himself. He yeah. dresses himself as John Harmon. Is this right? Blah blah blah. And in the course of that, he he, he tells about as about an experience he had where he left his body. He was drugged, uh, where he left his body and only came to uh, when um, when he realised he was drowning. Right. But he was dragged back into himself. So yeah. this this. this Multiple John Harmons, John Gropesmiths, uh, Julian, whatever his name is, in the book, there is there does seem to be some kind of it's actually an effort uh, for him to drag them all together and and and, and reconcile them all. And of course, we also get the the, the other John Harmon, the the baby, the name John Harmon. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the, there's some kind of game going on there with maybe games wrong word going on there with I get identity, um, his identity specifically that, that I find really interesting. Right, um, Karen, what do you want to add? Yeah, Karen. 
Right. Um, I, building on Liam's um, comment, I, th I think it's unusual, is it not, for Dickens to use this kind of prolonged almost soliloquy, this internal monologue that we have um, in book two, chapter 13. We have seven entire pages right. of John Harmon's story in his own mind or as he's speaking aloud to himself. And I just found that uh, very Shakespeare-like uh, or Ahab-like from Moby Dick. I mean, the whole internal monologue thing clarifies everything about every question we might have had with what happened. But the writing technique I found somewhat different than what I've been used to in terms of Dickens sometimes. Yes, I, don't know. Yes, I think that, that that's true. And if someone is trying to uh, trying to determine, you know, if, if he's taking on a piece of a Nicodemus character and trying to determine what am I going to do to make sense of this? What am I going to do? Because I have taken on the I have taken on the role of a legal imposter, uh, and I have taken on the role of a victim, and I have taken on the role of a of someone who might be an actual conspirator against me might have been um, as someone contributing, or certainly as far as, as Rogue Riderhood knows, someone who is quite capable of doing violence uh, because he recognizes the, the clothing uh, as, as Red Hood. So it's interesting, yes, yes, right. And we have also with that, the reflections that we will see looking forward. And, and some of them, the reflections in Bradley Headstone's head um, uh, as he's trying to understand why, what's happened, that his great plan uh, to, to become a, a, not a gentleman, but at least someone who is respectable, how that plan is not working out at all, even for a factory girl, because Lizzie's gone from being an, uh, uh, a, a, an associate of her father, an apprentice of her father, to, in being a gaffer, to now being a working girl, not a, in, a, in a legitimate and positive sense. And uh, that's interesting as well. So yes, there are lots of the, the tapestry. I wish he would, well, of course the fun would be gone in reading if he had tied up all those threads into a very clear tapestry. That wouldn't, that wouldn't leave us any, any thinking to do. It wouldn't have kept, kept people interested either as they read through the week to week to week to week to week <laughs> publications of the book. So yeah, great, great. Gwendolyn? Yes, um, I was thinking in terms of the mirrors of Jenny Wren and her little doll, yes. uh, Miss Truth. Jenny yes. Wren being one of the truth tellers yes. of Dickens. And she has her little doll speak for her, mm -hmm. right. putting the little doll next to her and looking at Eugene and yeah. let's see what you're about. Um, are you um, are you real or are you deceptive? Uh, she's trying to figure him out. She's not sure about him. She's very sure about Charlie, that she doesn't like him and that um, he will not be her cock robin. Um, so I, I, I think she's a very interesting figure in terms of mirroring with her dolls. Right, and that brings up perhaps another pattern that we need to, that's not on the list. That's why I love conversations like this. Um, and that if you hear noises in the back, I'm gonna stand up in a minute, let my dog out of her crate because she just woke up. And uh, when she hears other voices from the Zoom, she thinks she needs to protect me from something. So she starts to bark, I'll stand up a minute and shoo her out the door. But, uh, but when we think about, um, when we think about, this is such an interesting book because of the cripples in it. We have Silas Wegg and Jenny Wren. And so, and I think crippling may be, um, and also, uh, uh, well, we'll get to literacies in a minute if that's we're talking about literacies. But when you think about the, the really confused literacy of Silas Wegg uh, and the desire on the part of both Jenny and um, Lizzie to get legitimate literacy, 
And we have to remember they're getting it from uh, a mature Jewish man, you see, Raya, who is perhaps teaching, and we, uh, this, is a, this is a stretch, but it's not a very big stretch. He's teaching them the word, right? And so when you add that to what must I do to be saved, you see, what words do I have to know? What stories do I have to tell? How can I tell a true story for, from, for John Harmon, as we've been talking about, I think with really good insight, how do I know what's happened to me? You see, how do I, how do I know that? I can't even tell my own story, it's so confused. Uh, so I think those are, are issues also when we think about reflecting as, as thinking, reflecting on things. So yeah, wonderful. You guys are great. Anybody else want to say anything? And, and we have the mirror thoughts. We have, you know, the issue of uh, Fledgeby trying to reflect. He's trying to reflect on and to reflect Raya's position, uh, Raya's thinking. And, and he can't do that well. And when he finds out he has the, the girls teaching them on the roof, uh, that you see that, that that's such a, a strange thing and he wants to see Jenny Wren as a customer. Uh, so, and the whole business is what, of what do we do with junk, right? Jenny Wren makes, dog, makes a living from junk. Mr. Venus makes a living from old bones, loose bones, right? So, okay. Well, what about couples? Shall we go on to couples? And if somebody, if you think of something about reflections, we can jump back. So there were a couple of hands up. Um, oh, I'm Liam, sorry. I, I, okay. didn't, I can't see them. Uh, That's what we need you for. Thank you. Uh, uh, Liam and then no, well, Gail. I, I took mine down to let Gail go first. Oh, okay. Gail. I see Gail. And was there somebody else? Uh, Liam, but uh, Gail, why don't you go first? Oh, she's muted. Well, well, I just go and get it out of the way. Um, okay. I, I was going to say anything. Oh, yeah. Um, it was just because, sorry, it's not going on to couples, uh, Karen, continuing with something you said earlier. It's fine. About, you can continue with that. About people trying to um, find ways of, like, how can I remake myself? I, I, I take it your point at the very start when you talked about. Um, um, Mm -hmm. Harmon has been in the river and, and come out and taken a new name. You, you're right. making a point about baptism. That it, right. it's, yes. And right. he's, so it, it's like, he, he's in a weird position. I mean, it's a bit like uh, George in um, It's a Wonderful Life, where he gets to see, what, well, if I was dead, what would the world be like without me? And, and he, he's in a weird position because John Harmon's dead. He, he could actually come back and, and start a new life for someone else. Um, right. And he thinks quite a lot about it. He thinks mm -hmm. quite a lot about, you know, what, what help would I be identifying myself now? Um, right. You know, would, would the boffins be any happier? Would Bella be any happier? Could, mm -hmm. could, would the world have been any better if I had still been alive or, or would it have been worse? Exactly. And, and, and I think... Um, <laughs> That that's really interesting. Yes, the, the, the sort of the the the, the that's not a huge dilemma, but the sort of dilemma he has there. Yes, yeah. well, and and um, you know the lamels are constantly making themselves up too. Yeah, as well. So yeah, Gail, did you get unmuted? Or was that's, it that's exactly what I was going to say. He gets to be uh, he gets to be dead and see how people react to. Him. And, the, you know, the importance of the way the boffins react. I mean, how gratifying that is. I mean, don't we all wonder how people <laughs> people will react? But he, it's as though he's so close to death um, yeah. because he is sort of dead. And mm -hmm. and there's a lot of characters who are close to death. I mean, Jenny Wren seems halfway here and halfway there. And that's why she can communicate, you know, better with, uh, you know, and she says, come up and be dead, come up yes. and be dead. Um, and that amazing scene that takes place with the church, with the graves that are sort of on eye level and Bradley keeps 
grabbing you know, a gravestone and almost pulling it off. I mean, death just seems so near in this in this novel. Right. And uh, and with one character actually sort of crossed over, you right. know, and having that perspective from the other side. Yeah. It just it struck me as I was reading last night. Yeah. I love your connection to the headstone. Uh, we'll, speak, <laughs> we'll come back to that. Hey, Wayne. Wait. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is kind of beside the point, but. Oh, what fun. Anyway. Yeah. Well, the Lamels, I think, have been imitated more than once in later novels and movies. Oh, yes. Yeah. Bride and groom discover that each thought the other was rich. <laughs> yes. I can't think of any examples, but I, I want to pay Dickens tribute here for I think he's or the originator of this right. wonderful story. <laughs> yes, right, right. Well, and, and uh, if we take that the other way around, um, Bella Wilfer thinks that Rocksmith is poor. But yes, he's really not. He's rich, and and she's going. She has to begin to deal with that and uh not what we don't see that because she's that occurs that his revelation occurs you know well as the novel is as Dickon is beginning to break up the pieces of the plot for us for the end hi Jen Glenna um hi can you hear me yes um I was thinking about this whole business of reflection um a very rich topic um, in the remarkable scene where um, Mrs. Lemley, um, Sophronia, um, sees herself reflected through the eyes of someone other than her husband. And right. she tries to take, um, is it Twemlow she takes aside? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, tries to get him to uh, help her rescue uh, poor Georgiana from right. Alfred's plot. And very much, I think it's a question of her her looking at her own conduct through the yeah. eyes of someone who isn't a devil as Alfred is. Right. And who, um, yes, she says, at least, you know, at least clear me, or, or she's going to allow him to make her, uh, her the bad person because they will, they will describe her as the plotter, the primary plotter. Um, yeah. So she's going to set that that story of herself into sort of the, the re, which is the reality. I mean, that is what she's involved in, at least with Alfred. So, you know. And what we've been really talking about the thoughts and mirrored thoughts already as we're thinking about those reflections, how the thinking, how the the issues are reflected. If we think about uh, Bradley Headstone. They're saying, how can I work this hard? How can I work this hard and gone through all I've done? And now I'm not acceptable to a working girl. Now I'm not acceptable uh, to Charlie Hexum's sister. How can that, how can that possibly be? And uh, and we and uh, we think about um, uh, who's the I lost the character's name who is enamored of Bradley Headstone, Miss Peach, Miss Peacher. Peacher. Miss Peaches. Yeah. And uh, how, how she, she understands his thinking, but, but she is, uh, but she's, well, she's astonished a little, I think, uh, or so intent on having uh, a relationship with him that she can't, can't go any further than, uh, any farther than she is, is uh, managing it at the time. My favorite person too in that is the, the little girl that's with her that keeps raising her hand and <laughs> she's ready to talk. It, it's, it's one of the great comic scenes when when he keeps she keeps saying things like where are you going uh, and he says I'm just, I popped in on my way and she says uh, where to and, and he says uh, oh to, just to where I'm going and she says mill bank by the yeah bye, bye, bye. Right. She knows she exactly. knows. we hear the words in her head that's right, and that's just wonderful example of mirrored thoughts. He says something and <clears throat> pops up in her in her head what she what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm thinking. Vicky, did you have your hand up? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, I did have my hand up. I was thinking about the 1882 Education Act, mm -hmm. which was education for all. Mm -hmm. At that time, there were many young people who were surviving um, where they had previously died. And there were a lot of young people around and the middle classes were concerned to keep them away from creating havoc. Mm -hmm. And they used education and they used, um, sorry, dogma on religion right. as a means and they, They'd had a lot of extensive, edu extensive conversations regarding what should be taught in the school and what the children needed to know. Mm -hmm. Regardless of anything else, everybody always knew. And it was a whole new idea to have education available and the Sunday schools and so on. So that at that time, there was a lot of discussion about what was the religion to teach and how you taught it. And it was absolutely essential to people living in those times that the education would very much incorporate um, the dogma of the time and that the children would know it. Right. So the very fact that it was so well known would have been a reflection in a way of how Dickens saw the indoctrination. Right. And how it unfurled. Yes. Yes, uh, that, and that's, that's a great point for context. And Dickens was quite um, upset when he was involved in the ragged schools because yes. they were trying to get the street children uh, in at least for civil, at, as much civilizing as they could do. If we think about Tom All Alone's in Bleak House. Um, and he was, just infuriated by the fact that for a period of time that at that those uh, pro pieces of progress stopped as the clergyman argued about what what part of the Bible they should start with. In and sorry, no, please go ahead. Um, the interesting thing was that the children had to have shoes. Yes. And my grandmother said that she as a girl couldn't go to school because the boys had to be the ones who had the education and they were much more important. And those things actually sneak in to Dickens. Yes. If you see, he reflects very well um, the underclass that the girls were, yes. because they were getting married and going to have children and it wasn't worth wasting your money on them. Exactly, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You see that also with uh, Biddy and Joe in um, Great Expectations too. Yeah. And she's the she's the in a in a school with her shoes running down. Her stockings are all messed up, and her her shoes are run down at the heel. Right? Yeah. Yes. And so, whose thoughts should they mirror? That's the you know what doctrines should they mirror? And uh, and that and the the tremendous emphasis on the fine points of grammar, and we see that Miss Peacher's conversations with. Uh, I think I'm having the attack of Alzheimer's. The young, the young girl's name with Miss Peacher. Oh, Jenny. Oh, it doesn't matter. But, uh, so we've all had. Oh dear, it's catching. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and and Marianne. Marianne, that's it, Marianne. And uh, uh, she, you know, she she's dealing with the grammar of of uh, how you deal with the name and the, and so on. And and uh, you think this is true. Okay, all well, that's quite true about grammar, but it's absurd that she's worrying about it when she's trying to find a way to get her Bradley Headstone's attention. Uh, wait. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, Bradley Headstone to me is another one of these fabulous descriptions that Dickens does 
of, uh, I guess, a psychological nature. Yes. But Bradley's intellect is completely car compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. he's, he's terrified that knowledge in one area will spill over to knowledge in another. Mm -hmm. but, and that certainly applies to his religion. He yes. has no concept that his religion should uh, color his actions or right. changes. So I, I think of Headstone being partly a description of him, of, his, oh, yes. uh, of Durance, a Durancey, whatever. Yes, well, that's <laughs> Thanks. Good. Face of stone head, right? Yes. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. He said it's brain stone, ossified, which puts him with Mr. Venus interested in bones. Um, yeah. Okay. Shall we look at, look at some couples? Let me just pull the screen down a bit. Yeah, there they are. Got lambs. There. Can I just ask them? Can I just ask them uh, again? It's forty years since I last read it, and and I've been doing it um, exactly to the 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 point where this part finishes. I think a few of us are probably doing uh -huh. it that way. So, uh, something on that list is making me nervous. Uh, can, can we try to avoid spoilers, please, for those of us who are exactly halfway through? <laughs> Oh, no, I, I don't, this doesn't go beyond. It, this list doesn't go beyond. We're not going on beyond, no. Okay. So if we look at this, if we look at this list, we've got the Lammels, Fledgeby and Raya, Fledgeby and Georgiana, Bradley Hitchstone and Lizzie. And let me see if I can get this off of here. I can't get that last one. Um, Eugene and somebody. Look, look. I'm going to pull this. Uh, it's Eugene and somebody. We'll we'll get to that. So if we Mortimer. think about, you, Eugene and Mortimer. I'm sorry. It says Mortimer on the screen. Yes, you Eugene and Mortimer. That. Okay. Okay. So, or we could do any other couple that you thought about. I thought we had. Uh, the Lammels are a good starting place. These are these are interesting uh, couples. Think about Fledgeby, Raya on one hand, Georgiana on the other. Karen, mm -hmm. uh, Karen I kind of there. see you've titled. Oh dear, my dogs are barking. Sorry, you've That's titled right. this couples, but I kind of see these as partnerships and partnerships for good or ill. Um, I think that there's a lot of mutuality here that can be extremely bonding when we look at your list and. Uh, the partnerships, the bonding can be either evil or good. And right. I think they're very strong in those ways. So um, it's very interesting that all these pairings or mutuals, um, they just- I you saw that, that's why I called them couples. So right. vividly. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, I'm, that was it. Oh, well, but let's talk about the, let's talk about the, um, the mutuality. Okay, or true or false. Fledgeby and Raya, Fledgeby and Georgiana. Fledgeby can't even talk to Georgiana, can he? He can't, he can't make it a statement that makes much sense. Uh, he is uh, unmet, he's astonishingly flustered. But when he is Raya, <laughs> the the uh, relationship is much more defined uh, because Fledgeby is the one in charge. Um, so, any observations you want to make about Fledgeby and Raya?
This is an interesting. Oh, somebody. I was just going to say it comes up okay. a few times in, in Dickinson. Well, it's it's a it's a um it's a, a trick you do in fiction, where where uh, in you know novels where one person's re one person's the agent for what's going on. It, ha it happens in Bleak House with uh, Smallweed and and Tolkien. Okay. You think what the, the characters in the novel think somebody is doing something, but really there's somebody else pulling the strings, which, which is sort of what's going on with with Fleds being right. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'll just say I, I find it difficult to see connections between th that those five groups of people because they're, they're so the, the relationships are so so different. But I guess the Lammels are pretending to be a couple. Uh, Fledby and Raya are pretending not to know each other. Right. Fledby and Georgiana really don't have a relationship, and people, other people are pretending there is a relationship. I, I, um, you got it. Keep going. It's a weird kind of list. <laughs> right. And Bradley Headstone and Lizzie, you see, it's similar. Bradley Headstone and Lizzie, he wants to be a couple. He imagines there's, a, there's some. He imagines there's some connection. Yes. And it's being blocked. Right. And he can't imagine that she would not be interested in him and moving up socially um, and so on. And then Eugene and Mortimer. Well, they have similar backgrounds and they, um, they mm -hmm. naturally are with themselves. I mean, they, they are a natural couple because they, uh, they're compatible. <laughs> Um, uh, also, uh, Lizzie and uh, Jenny Wren, yes, uh, who, who's who also has a false name, right? She 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 was Fanny Cleaver, but decided to become Jenny Wren. Um, and um, I would say uh, uh, Charlie Hexham and Headstone, yes, oh, because yeah. Charlie has right. adopted all the cant and dogma that got him to be the top boy in the class, mm -hmm. and now he's imposing it on his sister. Right. And uh, telling her, why wouldn't you marry him? He's not going to get anything from it. So that must mean he's an honorable man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, what that list leaves out, I'm sure deliberately, uh, are, are the actual couples, uh, the Boffins, uh, the Wilfers, the Podsnaps. The, 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 I, I think the Wilfers an interesting couple. Boffins. I, uh, the the Boffins, the Wilfers, the Podsnaps, yes. I'm right. not sure there was any more. The actual the oh. Right. Yes. The earrings. Yeah. I, I loved uh, Mr. Wilfer's um explanation to Bella after she's taken him out to get his suit of clothes about what a partner his wife is. <laughs> and yeah. it's it's I, I keep thinking that I this is his penultimate novel, and I don't know that he knew it, but I feel like I'm getting a review of so many things from the past and also from his life about the, the, the country, the fancy house being like an old cheese that has lots of parasites in it and people patronizing him to buy tickets and, uh, and then the Pickwickian uh, uh, campaigning by veneering and, uh, and then the whole mother, uh, daughter, father thing, which is just, I mean, if you want to do couples, all the fathers and daughters that are tied up. Jenny Wren takes mm -hmm. care of her drunken daughter. Lizzie takes care of her, her, her father. Um, that goes on and on as well. Right, yes. Yeah, I, I tried to stay away from the biological ones, thinking that what would, what would happen is what's happening. And that is we would be, we would see other classes and the, the biological ones are as interesting as these. Um, because you has, have Mrs. Wilfer pretending to be the, the uh, upstaged, wealth, upstaged woman of, of class and uh, del delicate breeding and, and uh, in her behavior toward everybody. And when, when that, that marriage is not, not at all, you know, she's, she's not at all that. And then, um, and then of course, um,
Georgiana Podsnap and her father. You know, are very there's there's really no connection at all, except he doesn't want there to be a blush on the face of the any blush on the face of the of the young girl, so the young child. So he doesn't. There's no no sense of her growing into a, a purposeful uh, individual, a purposeful um, identity. Yeah. And then there's Pleasant Riderhood and her father. Yes, yes. Marvelous, marvelous <laughs> character. Yes. Enterprising, and, and, and she makes her, her living from uh, used items as well. Yes, yeah. And that's, did that's they, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, did everyone else find um, the relationship between Bella and her father as touching as I did. I found it really moving. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about that is she does not seem to see him as quite as an adult. Um, or perhaps the adult responsible for the family. But it is it is a touching, a touching relationship, right? I think uh, another touching relationship is the friendship between Eugene and Mortimer. Yes. Where Mortimer is very supportive of Eugene and seems to get a real kick out of him, mm -hmm. even uh, though he uh, is often so bored with life and can't mm -hmm. muster up any energy to get really involved in anything. Mortimer is still um, a very supportive friend. He worries about him when it looks as if he might be uh, involved in a relationship with Lizzie that would hurt her mm -hmm. as well as him. Yes. Uh, so he's, he's concerned about him in that way. Um, and I think Eugene is equally fond of Mortimer uh, though they're very different personalities. Um, so for a friendship, mm -hmm. I think this is a really well-drawn one. Right. Um, so we have a, a number of hands up. Okay, yes. Um, so no. Wayne. Am I audible? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Can't resist saying with regard to Eugene and Mortimer, uh, some critics have just said openly, uh, Mortimer is in love with Eugene. Mm -hmm. But I know that in the text, uh, Dickens mentions that they were boys together at school. Right. Now, that could be innocent. It could not be innocent. <laughs> yes, right. Then uh, I also, about Eugene, I, I think this is a point that uh, Rosemary Bodenheimer makes in her essay, The Double Doubled that Eugene and Bradley form yes. a couple. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, Bradley's what uh, mm -hmm. Jung would have called uh, Eugene's shadow. I mean, literally, oh shadows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. Lana? Hi, um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, Eugene and Mortimer. <laughs> It seems to me that, yes, they're true friends. I have a dog that just jumped in my lap. Um, but they also um, reinforce some of the unfortunate um, uh, traits in one another. The, you know, easy relaxing into not making much of an effort because the despised fathers are going to be backing them up. Mm -hmm. And I think I wanted to talk about Eugene too. It seems to me he's he's got a kind of indeterminacy about him that is not necessarily something you see with a lot of Dickens characters. Mm -hmm. You really don't know whether he's going to wind up seducing and ruining Lizzie. The right. reader doesn't know, or whether um, he will somehow do the right thing by her. Uh, Eugene doesn't know it about himself. Um, and Mortimer is, Mortimer is concerned that he not do the wrong thing, but Mortimer also is, um, 
is a tether to aspects of his personality that are um, not necessarily positive or so it seems to me. And I know I'm getting, I don't wanna say much, but um, Karen, I'm just fascinated by your idea about ba your background of researching baptism and regeneration, because I think well, you're gonna find out that has a lot to do with Jean, Eugene's fate. Yes. Yeah, we I've been careful not to not to talk about that because we that's going to come up in the next two books where we have identical, almost identical. We we we've had the we've had Harmon's apparent drowning, but not quite. We have Gaffer either killed and then and in his boat or dying because the boat he was entangled in the in the uh, in the ropes of his boat. In, in a high tide. And then we're going, and I don't want to talk about these right now. And then we're going to have two more uh, moments like that. And and those are going to be very, I mean, at that point, we'll spend some time talking about uh, uh, notions of what's the difference between resuscitation and regeneration. Uh, because only one, one is a resuscitation and the others are, maybe, uh, and, and then we all, uh, so, Anyway, we'll save that. Um, I, you're absolutely right. Think about that. You see that pattern, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, um, yeah. David. Okay. <clears throat> Two small points. The Eugene Mortimer relationship was common enough that W. S. Gilbert. Mm -hmm. up in Iolanthe, where two of the peers are arguing about uh, which of them would regret the other's death more. And one of them says, we were boys together, or at least I was. <laughs> and uh, the other thing I want to say is that one of the couples who deserve consideration Mm -hmm. is the veneerings yes who reflect and well the lamleys mm -hmm. mrs veneering uh cries right at the right moment she shows her female um emotions right at the right right moment and uh, you yeah. know and the Lamleys are very interesting. Sophronia's, uh, the husband seems to me to be a cousin to Headstone in the, in the, in the rage and, and the expression on his face. Um, Sophronia is, is, I can't, I can't place her, or it's hard to, to see her in connection to Bella or Lizzie in terms of someone who seeking a place uh, made enough of a false identity for herself that the place she had reflected, and this is where the reflection, the place, the false reflection she had drew her to another person's false reflection without her being able to see uh, uh, how uh, Alfred was basically uh, not what he seemed at all. And it's interesting that they can't see that until they're, they're stuck with each other and, and have their moment of revelation uh, on their moments of revelation on their honeymoon. So that's, uh, it's interesting that two reflections can't see that they are reflections. Um, in, in terms of Sophronia, I'm just realizing there's one character who doesn't have a double, at least not that I can see, is Twemlo. Twemlo. Yes. And he becomes her partner at a very crucial moment. Yes, yes. Um, and he, um, and we get back to the whole mutual friends, yes. <laughs> which yes. are also yes. partners. <laughs> that's right. Um, but that scene, um, it made me go back and read the second chapter when we're introduced to Twemlow, and I was ready to dismiss him as another 
you know, sad sack, fallen right. aristocrat person. And suddenly he's got this little heroic snap of the portrait book. Right. Um, yes. And um, so it makes me want to wait till the next reading. But I, I really <laughs> loved having Fuemblo come back up like this. It was a very interesting uh, plot device. Yes, he, he, will, he will appear. I don't want to... I'm not going to say any more than this, but he, we're not done with, Twemlow's not done with us yet. So, uh, right. And what's interesting is he's the only one that worries about the truth of the relationship he has with all of the others. He's the, he's the, uh, the piece of the table. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. He's yes. the attachment to the table and they build a, though I have Twemlow here because He's Lord Snigsworthy's cousin. Right, he's right. Sitting in the world. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Talk about literacy. He tries to parse his genealogical attachments, right? He says, oh, well, they're his best friends now, but I was their best friend first. And that hysterically funny scene where everybody starts shaking hands with Podsnap, thinking he's yes. veneering, <laughs> including admiring the baby who looks so much <laughs> like him. <laughs> So literally, the ge genealogy and the literacy of of that group is uh, d dysfunctional. <laughs> right. And that may be the problem of living in a hall of mirrors, where what we see what we see is is reflection and not and not substance. Um, because veneering looks enough like Podsnap, and Snap Podsnap looks enough like veneering that they're they're and the occasion. You know, who's no who knows what's how whose house they're in because they all basically may have different fronts but they have all the things that are the same inside so the, the, i think that's a the, wonderful point moment for, in the novel the, so, there's that also there's that wonderful moment in in this part that we've read for this meeting uh where we get the payoff on the the stuff we've had earlier but Fremlo, because um uh, veneering finally says, is it veneering or post -up? Finally says to him, um, you know, you're my very, very oldest friend. And, and, Trem, Trem, and Tremlo thinks, oh my God, that settles the question once and for all. I finally know the answer. Um, oh. uh, but what I was going to talk, talk about was, um, you'd, I, I think Eugene and Mortimer are a different kind of character. The, 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 and to a certain extent, um, Rokesmith, the, the, the Rokesmith stroke, whatever his real name is. Um, um, we're only just starting to get to know, I, I couldn't call him Rokesmith because it comes easy, most easily, to get to know Rokesmith because we've met him in bits and pieces. But, but you, the thing about these three characters, uh, apart from the fact they're male, which I'm sure is relevant to a certain extent, is they, they're educated intellectuals. They're, they're, Dickens is treating them as sort of equals. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, when they're thinking through problems, they're thinking through problems in the same way that perhaps Dickens might, perhaps he might expect the reader to. A lot of the other characters, I'm not saying it's a criticism at all, but a lot of the other characters are, are, are kind of cartoons kind of, I mean, Angus Wells talked about diversity and depth in, in English fiction, uh, and he said, you know, George Eliot writes characters, a small number of characters, and you know every single thing about them. You, mm -hmm. you know them inside out. Uh, and De and he, he's not saying it as a criticism, he's not saying two different styles. Um, Dickens writes a whole load of characters, and he just needs to sketch in something, and, and you feel like you know them. You know everything about the veneerings. Because they're a type, um, you you know everything about the de about Downtrod and Mister Wilfer because he's a type you recognise. Um, mm -hmm. But but Eugene and Mortimer are, are kind of characters from a psychological novel. You know, we we're, we're, Eugene's Eugene's genuinely troubled. He's not sure what he wants. He said Mortimer asked him questions. He can't answer because he's. Um, I, um, I, I just find them, I, I think I said in the last minute, I find Eugene really interesting for a Dickens character. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's true. Um, okay. Shall we? Okay. One more. 
Uh, yes, Gwendolyn? Wonderful. Yes. Um, yes, just uh, back to Sophronia for a minute. I wonder if anybody felt that her um, moving toward being a better person, uh, helping Georgiana, seemed sudden to anybody else. It didn't ring true the way she's been presented so far. So is this the beginning of some transformation in her? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just wondered if other people felt that her behavior suddenly with wanting to help Georgiana seemed a little abrupt to be believable. I, I think that there is the, the question of whether there was a connection between Sophronia and Bella. And I think, you know, Bella initially talks about being a mercenary and really wanting to, to follow money and being in love with money. And we see her, her uh, slowly evolve and become more than that. And I wonder if Sophronia might be doing the same thing. Yes. Interesting. We'll see. <laughs> Go ahead. You said yes, yes, that she's. Yeah, I, I agree with that. <laughs> I think, and and the way um, Bella changes is that she sees his hideous reflection in Boffin as he's acting, mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe uh, Sophronia sees that in her husband. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, she just comes to know him, to know him is to loathe him, you know, <laughs> and and. and and then she begins to separate. I mean, she's always been separate from him, of course, but I mean, to see this magnified image of what she is possibly turns her around. Wow. But, you know, as we were talking also, I was thinking about um, the difference between friendship and our mutual friend and that whole central notion and connection. You know, there's all this you know, which is what, oh, my dearest friend, my dearest friend, those are just connections. Those are use transactional relationships you know there what use can I make of you and the um the uh, theme or whatever the gimmick the <laughs> plot uh, of manipulation in this novel is so strong I mean everybody is just not everybody but many many people are using other people for their benefit and um it, it, that just that just seems to me so central. I mean, it's the central thing of Bella when she cries out, you know, I, I would have been sold as a dog or, mm -hmm. you know, I was just, nobody mm -hmm. was, I was just used. And and then shortly thereafter, there's the manipulation of Georgiana. They're yes. trying to, uh, the Lambleys are trying to get something out of her, but it just seems it, it goes way back. I mean, everybody is trying to use everybody else. So the you know, when Charlie says, you know, he's not trying to get anything out of you, he's, you know, to Lizzie, he's actually dis dis disinterested. It's actually a sort of powerful plea in in the, in, an all, in a world where everybody is using everybody else for something else. I mean, the use, the use of other people, the manipulation of other people, I think is really important. Right. People that they have become um, commodities. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and if we are going to think about the dust heaps, uh, they become commodities that can be easily tossed aside or devalued to the point that they are more uh, objects than they are than they are people or names than they are people. Uh, and, and you see that naming, the importance of names only uh, in Veneering's campaign for parliament. You know, they all are going to. Yeah. Will he go down? Will he go up for Parliament? And then they have him. The money's exchanged, and he's he is uh, a member of Parliament, so he's veneering MP. And, uh, um, and it, uh, in relation to that, there's the Lady Tippins going around town, electioneering for him, right. and she's the one who pulls <laughs> the uh, cover off the thing, um, saying that uh, nobody knows who these veneerings are. And they know nobody, and they have a house out of the tales of the genie, and give dinners out of the Arabian Nights, um, and that—that's she basically is pulling the curtain back and saying, yeah. "Here is here is the wizard," um, right? In with much glee, um, but it makes me realize too that where is Lady Tippins in all this? Who is her double, um, or who is her partner, or? 
that's yeah. Edgerton. She is the one that has all the lovers, okay, in her calendar, in her diary. Uh, oh, yes, right, 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 right. And um, Glenna. Hi, Glenna. Yeah, she, she has the lovers in her. Is there's an interesting scene, too, um, that we will visit again and I believe this is at Sophronia's wedding where she has her little eyeglass and she is telling uh, I don't think I think she's telling Twemler she's just talking to herself uh, about the value how much money was spent on the on the fabrics and she said oh this is so much a yard oh so much a pound and that headdress is saying she can actually, and in that regard, her her double is Jenny Wren. Because Jenny looks at the people uh, in the carriages and when she's making her dolls, she looks at those people as the kind the yards of fabric, what kind of decorations does she need? Um, and and they're they are sort of uh, dressed mannequins. And it's interesting that Lady Tippins is the one that does that because that to me says that there's more to her in terms of being the being an observer but we only see that for just um, just a moment and great connection yes do what great connection of uh, jenny wren and lady tippins yeah. wonderful well and i love how jenny wren complains about the doll who has three daughters and yeah. is going to bankrupt their father yes, right. and they change their minds every day as to what fashion they want to wear <laughs> yes. so um vicky had her hand up i'm not sure vicky okay. do you want to say something yes please sorry um i see the passage we've been looking at very much as dickens trying to decide or decipher which way his interpretation of religion will be and that the struggle he's having is between what has been imposed on on people or at least and and what really is and that it's um it's very interesting i don't know if any of any of my friends have read lark rise by flora thompson but it's a brilliant book that was written about the time that we're talking about. And it shows how the indoctrination of religion is, how religion is presented um, absolutely as it was. It's absolutely fascinating. And when you look at that and you look at how this is unfolding, it's almost as though, to me, Dickens is saying, well, what is the truth? What is it that, that we're trying to find? I don't know if that makes yes, sense. I'm, I'm very, I'm very glad to have the title of that book because uh, that I think I, I agree that the issue is who, and the whole question is who is our mutual friend? You know, is it the river? Is it death? Mm. Is it our mutual friend, a healthy self? You know, who is that, and why is it our instead of my, my mutual friend? Um, uh, you know, it's uh, is it a person that comes into life that refuses to let me lie? In which case that would be more on the Mortimer, or do we all have those in life who would encourage us to be uh, the reflection of something rather than to be authentic people? And so Flora, I think sorry, Flora Thompson wrote two books. The first one is Lark Rise, and the next one is called Lark Rise to Candleford. And both of them are, I've always found very, very impressive and helped me to understand Dickens and so on so much better. Excellent. Would you say the title of the second one? Lark Rise to Candleford. Okay. She, she didn't give the name of where she was writing about. So mm -hmm. that's why she called it Lark Rise. And then the next bit was Lark Rise to Candleford. And in fact, they made some television programs the BBC have over time. But I don't know whether they're accessible mm -hmm. because we sort of watch English television, um, often in a different way than most. Right, right. 
So we do too. <laughs> I don't know if it's a different way, but we. Well, it's sort of getting the access to it. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And very interesting. Very interesting. Um, uh, shall we? Any couples we want to add? Someone mentioned uh, Jenny Wren and Lizzie. Shall we talk about them? Wayne has his hand up. Yeah, Wayne. Wayne, Wayne. Oh, I, before we leave Sophronia. Okay. I think that she sees in Georgiana a younger, better version of herself. Yes. Mm -hmm. In addition, I think Dick, uh, uh, Sophronia owes something to Becky Sharp in Vanity Fair. Uh -huh. Because both she and Sophronia do the right thing, possibly for the wrong motives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, by warning Georgiana, uh, Sophronia can exert power over people who try to manipulate her. Right. And uh, it's the right thing, but questionable motive. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Gwendolyn? Yes, uh, on Jenny Brennan and Lizzie, um, I think it speaks very highly for Lizzie that she has um, loves Jenny and uh, is is such a good friend to her and loyal to her um, where she could have just discounted this mm -hmm. little person mm -hmm. but she doesn't um, Jenny's very important to her right right and and she's very loyal to her um, and she goes with her to Mr. Ria's to yes. regenerate um yeah I, I just think it speaks very highly for lizzie and says a lot about her right right one thing that's interesting is that the major characters many of the some of the major characters in the novel have names that are are variants of elizabeth bella isabella is a, a variant of elizabeth and of course uh lizzie is a variant of Elizabeth, and Betty is a variant of Elizabeth. And so we have, if we think about those three characters, and I didn't put them on the screen because I thought we might enjoy just popping our, popping a cork and out of our heads and see what we, we discovered. So what, what would you think about Betty? Uh, just one other point. Yeah. Uh, Jenny or Jennifer yes. is a variant of um, oh, wait, no, no, I'm sorry. I think I may be wrong. I was thinking that might be a variant too, but maybe not. Um, sorry. I don't know. That would be very interesting if it were. Yeah. yeah. So but clearly they're very bonded, Jenny yeah, and um, they are. They busy. are. Yeah. And, uh, Uh, Jenny is very concerned about Lizzie's capacity to not be not be shaped by uh, Bradley Headstone, and uh, and he is clearly not happy when he has to con contend with her by himself. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so she's putting things. She puts you know she's literally stitching her life together as she stitches her way of life. And the interesting thing is, is that she buys some of the product, because we company, she buys some of the little pieces, scraps of ribbon and, and uh, decorative things to make her pen wrappers and, and the small things that apparently she pills as well as the dolls that have some doll floats. So, yeah. She's a businesswoman. But, um. Uh, Betty is interesting because uh, there's a wonderful passage about why she uh, wouldn't take young Johnny to the doctor and how she had been schooled by, you know, being in the underclass that you just take your 
ill child and clasp it to your breast and um and her maternal spirit made her keep him from going to a doctor because that's all she knew and yet she comes out as a saintly character too so we're not condemning her for that and then she disappears on what seems to be a pilgrimage um right. as a wandering uh, a tinker um right. so she's definitely got a little nicodemus in her too <laughs> yeah. right right and and hers is how can i have i may on the one side uh, perhaps say more a little literal more literal but i think that the case can also be made that she's how can i how can i save myself from this i save myself by keeping moving uh by and um in fact that's what dickens says at the end yeah. of that passage of uh, saving herself from penury and right. something yeah yeah and uh and she she you know she knows already what she must do and the the way that she knows she has to has to get away from sloppy as well uh, and mm -hmm. so she wants and she said i can't see him because he'll want to come with me and uh and he's already being well treated what by mrs boffin uh, so mm -hmm. interesting uh, and the, uh, that's interesting the the more uh, the more handicapped characters a number of handicapped characters that we have sloppy and we have jenny uh, that we are seeing in this in and silas wig that we're seeing in this novel that have central parts that are less than just the sort of in, interest the interest that would be put in a uh, perhaps a margin they, they are central uh to the to the novel uh, that that's a little bit new i don't think that the other novels have have three major characters that are handicapped in significant ways uh, well let's... would jenny's father be considered I mean, he's, he's so utterly useless. Yes, right. I think so, mm -hmm. I'm not as familiar with the whole body of Dickens as maybe more of you are, but no, what, but he is, you he know, is. how many other characters are at that level in Dickens where Pennyworth a rum and that's it. Right. Bad child to bed, you know, and all that. Right. No, I hadn't thought about that. I think that. I think that places him there too because he is is more like a child and she sometimes refers to him as the bad child um uh, right where mr wilfer may be thought of it there uh bella playfully thinks of him <clears throat> more as as a parent of him but she he's he clearly has an adult an adult job and he clearly is doing his best to keep the family uh, going yeah. Interesting. Glenna? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I want to talk about Jenny a little bit more. Okay. I was thinking about her um, just now and thinking about how she has these visions and how they sustain her. Um, and that made me think of another one of my favorite Dickens characters, Miss Flight in Bleak House, that both of them have this capacity to have these bursts of imaginative, um, oh, hyper-reality, I don't know mm -hmm. how to put it exactly, but these refuges in the realm of imagination mm -hmm. that sustain difficult lives. And I just love that Dickens creates these characters who have something to say about how people confront um, challenges that sometimes it's head on and uber realistic and sometimes it's creating flights of imagination that right. uh sustain right. i uh i and i think that that is um that's that's something for us to uh keep in mind because the the visionary that doesn't appear very often in dickens and jenny Wren has she has the the pictures of the angels that come down from the the light the children from of light and those are the things that sustain her i don't think that that 
necessarily we're having that presented to us as you know factual angels but it's an interesting she's an interesting character in that capacity will become uh, more uh, important more central at least as we as we go go forward in the in the plot of the novel um, she certainly has a clear knowledge of people uh, from their their social behaviors by by watching their clothes and so that's and how they she goes to various events in order to get a sense of the of the style and the fashions of the day and that's interesting too so it's not that she is a a recluse by any means and she's keeping her keeping keeping house together too uh, she knows people by their tricks and their manners yes yes <laughs> And, and that's such a that's such a wonderful um, uh, phrase because such a wonderful statement because we're watching an entire universe of characters, you know, their tricks and their manners. That's right. Papa through the keyhole. I mean, all these images, you know, once you know the book, it these things then become a part of you to for your your own perceptions of the world and. And, and coping, you know, like, gee, if I only had some pepper through a keyhole right now. Yes, right. <laughs> yes. Right. And I think I'm glad that you said shaping the world because that is that that is part of the way people are are shaping a world for themselves or are being shaped by somebody else's world as Bradley Headstone tries to shape uh, Lizzie Hexham's world by making her acceptable, by making her, uh, you know, a respectable person married to the schoolmaster. And, uh, and that's, that it's an interesting pattern. How am I acceptable? Velda Wilf Wilfer finds herself suddenly, you know, the recipient of all the social visiting cards when she moves in with the Moffats. <laughs> Everybody is now coming to visit and to see to see her in the beautiful house uh, in London. And that's what makes respectability. Um, and perhaps we're looking for um, what is, what's respectable means, what does that mean? The family ornament from yes. one household, she's the family ornament to the next household, the family ornament. Right, yeah. Good. My hand raising thing doesn't seem to work. Sorry, just can I oh, burst in? Just burst in. That's fine. I get it. Yeah. Um, who's talking? I'll talk. Um, I so last night I was struck by the uh, Mr. Boffin goes off on this patron patrons, and we're all patronized and that sort of wordplay. And then I picked up a, an echo with pension. You know, um, and how Mr. Twemlow becomes a dependent pensioner instead of a full human being. Relegate, I couldn't find that passage, but it was really interesting that he accepts the position of being pensioned in, instead of human. So, I mean, so it's dependence, this kind of dependence versus these uh, fiercely independent women, um, Jenny Rand and Betty Higdon, both of whom are physically compromised, you know, I mean, they're not the strong ones to walk off and, you know, be independent and uh, do what they do, but they're so amazingly independent. And, and so this whole kind of tension between, I mean, what Bella wants to do in marrying wealthy, wealthily is to find a patron, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what mercenariness is to find a patron, but of course that makes you patronized. Um, and and it co goes back somehow to this mutual. What is a sort of healthy human relationship? A mutual human relationship. Mutual friend, yeah. What is it? A relationship of of dependence, you know, or parasitism, which is what the Lam Lamleys are. They think they think you know they've got that made, but of course they foil themselves. I don't know. I just think it's so. Uh, yeah, patron. I mean, that just really struck me last night, that rant of Boffins. It seems to come out of nowhere right. um, in the parallel with pensioner mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and marriage for money, of course. Yeah, right. She, she said, said, I'll be okay. I'll marry just so long as I marry uh, uh, Bella. I'll let marry for money. Yeah. Which, of course, makes her patronized. I mean, puts her in an extremely right. dependent position. 
not independent at all yeah. um, or would have if she mm -hmm. had done it yes okay that's that's terrific thank you for for adding that um and we'll see that develop uh, more fully in the in the forthcoming in the in the next in the next book so that'll be that'll be fun to fun to read the november one um you want to take a, a minute to think about literacies or we could say um We could think about them being literate, or we could think about them capable of, of, of uh, useful, useful, uh, we could call them fluencies. I was going to say useful communication. We could think about the difference between literacies and fluencies. Um, mm -hmm. Is some like, like uh, Headstone, he has a, a weak kind of literacy. He has the fluency of the school language. He has uh, very little literacy of social interaction, uh, except from the schoolmaster's perspective. So his fluency is not good. Um, we see in little Johnny's dying scene in the hospital, uh, the doctor's been attending to him and he points to one of his toys and then he said he points at the doctor and says him I or he may be pointing to another child and the doctor understands that he wants the toys that he's been playing with to be placed on the, the shelf for the child next to him and so they end up spreading out all of his uh, things that Mrs. Boffin has brought for him uh, to all the children uh, in the in the hospital ward as he lies dying. So it's an interesting kind of, of fluency. And then sloppy, who is difficult to understand. He does have a kind of fluency. He is literate in managing the mangle. He has that uh, mechanical literacy. But it's a So I don't know if there's no place to go with that. We'll talk about picking dust and designing, but. Uh, Cynthia? I wondered if anyone thought there were characters who could read the river. Ah, yes, that kind of literacy, right. Yes, that, uh, of course, um, uh, Liz, uh, Lizzie's father, Gaffer um, can read the river, and so can um, Riderhood. Right, yes, right. And Lizzie. And Lizzie. And and Pleasant. Yeah, they they yeah, Pleasant as well, right? They, um, I, you know, it's it's a a good uh, dark, gruesome little topic to. Uh, on our way to Halloween here of, right. you know, <laughs> you have, have the bodies of, of water and, you know, like, like a bird watchers who, oh yes, that's the American flicker tail over there, you know, 25 yards away, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to be, to be able to identify some floating bob or some, something off in the mist, like, oh, that might be a dead body, you know, let me go towards it and get it, you know. <laughs> to be able to to see um, and be willing to interpret and touch and handle and deal in um, death and decay mm -hmm. in the river. Yes, right. Also, uh, Lizzie, when she's um, with her father, with that grand 50 pound present, she looks out over the river and imagines whether she might be going off to Asia with some guy or yeah, she, she yeah. projects her future. And that's also part of the, the changes that Dickens is writing about from going from an yeah. agrarian to a colonial um, yeah. industrial power. But it changes how yeah. people see the river that way too. Yes, right. But then she decides that she doesn't want to be so near the river. Mm -hmm. the the debated phrase i can't be too near it mm -hmm. 
you know, she, because it's it just brings brings back these awful memories that she wants to perhaps not be a part of anymore. Right. I just hold hold on to that thought till we get close to the end. Okay. Just hold on to that. I can't okay. make you hear it. Um, okay. What do we do with Silas Wade and his reading? His declining and falling. The decline and fall off of the Roman Empire. That's right. Yes. You have to love his response to it, even right. though I know it's it's supposed to be ludicrous in a way, but he loved those Roman emperors. Yes. And how many students would be, you know, that go through our school systems would be bored to death with this. Right. Uh, but but not Mr. Boffin. He, he no. thinks it's all very fascinating. Um, right. so you just have to love his uh, um, response. Right, right. I, oh, it, it, yeah, maybe somebody else has their, their hand up. Uh, Wayne? Yes, uh, I hadn't reread this in many years. When I reread the early part, with uh, Silas Wegg reading. It was so funny, but it makes me think that Dickens must have wondered sometimes when his work was read aloud, <laughs> what the people really got, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's uh, certainly, I get to take that one step further, uh, Wegg introduces this possibility that, uh, we can't really get at even the story, much less reality. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. Yeah. thank Which you. It's an interesting comment on his being a storyteller, right? Yeah. <laughs> or can we get to the story even without the writing, given how much we can understand of it and the way we retell yes. it? Does that have anything to do with the story that's being developed in history at the moment we're alive? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Silas Wegg learns to read that old house, though, doesn't he? That he's living in when he's in Boffin's house, the power. Uh, to see what might be there. Uh, and his his ability to improve his reading of the house because oh, because uh, initially he's he's reading the house that he's stationed in front of, making right. all all sorts of. Uh, stories about who might be inside. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Linda? Is it, whoops. Yeah, you're right. You're good. I'm, I'm on. Oh, oh, I saw my hand and I stopped. <laughs> um, is it in the book two where, um, um, Jenny's um, creative process, her observation of the uh, her models um, is talked about. I didn't see that because we mm -hmm. are just Could you repeat introduced the to her. Could you repeat the question, please, Linda? Oh, um, I did. I had an observation, but it may be in book three. Right. Um, so I was first asking if it's in book two, where um, Jenny's creative process, her inspiration of going out and looking at um, women and then coming back and design a doll, designing a doll mm -hmm. is discussed. Is that book two? I don't, I don't think so. Okay, I don't, okay. then I'll, I don't want to jump ahead. Well, it's just jump ahead a tiny bit. What would you say a tiny piece of your observation might be? Do you want me to go ahead with sure. that? Go well, ahead. in in this one chapter, Jenny goes out and she observes women doing different things, shopping, having tea, and she comes back and she designs a doll and she makes a couple of trips, one to capture their physicality, another to capture their costuming, um, their expression, 
And it reminded me of how I've heard authors describe how they will study people mm -hmm. and how that, you know, leads into a, you know, a creative literary product. Mm -hmm. And um, I couldn't help but think of, you know, the stories of Dickens walking the streets and how he must have looked at those on the streets, been inspired, come back and created um, the different characters we read about today. Right, right. You know, I think, I think that's uh, a perfectly sensible way to think about Jenny Rand. And she's one that's not looking at a mirror. She's not looking at a reflection. She's reflecting mm -hmm. on what she's right. 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 Yeah, that's, thank you for sharing, uh, adding that to us. Liam? Um, I, I I really like that point, Linda. That you know, the, but what? quite often you get um, characters who stand in for the artist. You know, mm. like it's a novel, but there's a character in it who's a painter, and you go, well, some of the things that they discuss there, you know, are really going to be things that that, that the author is thinking about uh, themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, the the idea of Jenny being the creative person who's who's creating art, uh, and, and therefore kind of um, a cipher for Dickens or a cipher for the artist right. is really interesting. Yeah, the other, the other thing, the other comment I found, I think it's, this has been a great meeting, by the way. Um, the other comment, I, was like, I can't remember who said it. The person who pointed out um, Jenny's similarity to Miss Flight. I I, I think that, mm -hmm. that, that was. That was really helpful. Um, I think there's kind of, some characters seem to be a little bit more than it's a, it, there's not a lot of the supernatural in, in Dickens. There's not a lot of, su of the supernatural in you know, mainstream mm -hmm. 19th century right. novel generally. But there, there's things that hint at the supernatural and things that hint at the, um, the, the people who know more than can see things that, that the rest of us can't see. Miss Flight can't really see anything. She's just been in court for so many years that she's she knows um mm -hmm. right. uh, fate will be inevitable. Mm -hmm. But she but but it, it, when she says things it's a bit like prophecy. Uh, and with Jenny certainly there's a sense of there's a sense of something magical about her. Although the, although the novel itself doesn't, it, the, the universe of the novel doesn't contain, this novel doesn't contain magic as such. Right. Um, there is a sense uh, right. that in places, the magical is going on. The big magical thing is, is obviously Harmon's come back from the dead. So there's yes. a magical kind of Christian right. moment at the centre of right. it, you know, that, um, but, but Jenny certainly is part of that. And that will be more important as we get closer to the last book as well, last chapters, right? And she certainly um, sees the aspects of the their trickery, the aspects of people from from making the dolls. Uh, yeah. Now that's that's a really that's a great point. Yeah. Um, is there another character that? makes other characters or makes, oh, sorry, Gwendolyn. Oh, uh, I was just gonna make a small point about Jenny. Yes. Um, not exactly her literacy, but uh, the fact that she renames herself yes. a character uh, from a nursery rhyme. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to assume that she's probably read a lot of those. I don't know if we can assume that. We can assume that Dickens readers would have mm -hmm. made the connection with right. Jenny Wren, the um, figure in the nursery rhyme. And it's so fitting for her, I think. Mm -hmm. She is just like a little bird. Right, right. And a, a very saucy one, too. Yes, right. Which Jenny Wren is in the nursery rhyme. Right, yeah. yeah. I think that's, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Her literacy as well as to 
you know, the small ones that see, um, you know. What about Bledgebury and Lamel? What literacies do they have? Or fluencies for both? Wayne Glenn has a hand up. Oh, sorry, Wayne. I'm not seeing that. I won't. Amazing. Wayne? I'll click the one you want. Well, amazing. I guess it will come back to us. Okay. Um, When I think of literacy in, well, uh, uh, Silas Wegg is one of the top characters for me in this book because um, of his knowledge of music and his ability to uh, sell songs and sing songs and talk about songs and, and, so, and that he, um, you know, rain or shine, puts up his his little stall and mm -hmm. sells music and since i i have a background in music i uh i <laughs> took right on, on to this as a research project so maybe in a future um meeting i'll speak a little bit more about this but i i found and created a small body of research um all the songs that he mentioned Oh, really? And because it was um, obviously something that Dickens put in his novels because his readers would have recognized all the songs mm -hmm. mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so, and then if you look at the texts of some of the songs and, and some of the, um, the jokes or sub substitutions that uh, Wegg makes, you know, so he's, he, uh, he definitely has, has to be put uh, in a very high place as far as literacy, because, um, you know, just even having that background in sales and music and poetry, um, you know, that's, it's, it's not just the, um, the gimmick of, well, a man with a wooden leg teaching me, ha ha ha, you know, you know how to read. It's he, he whether he had a wooden leg or not, still being out there with uh, the songs and the music and you know, being a man of of letters in that yeah. regard you know so that's what attracted boffin to yes. engage him as his uh, tutor you know right. Right. So, and then if you think of all all the different uh, odd jobs that people have like you know catch as catch can you know being an, an uh, opportunist well somebody wants this sort of lesson Sure. Yes, <laughs> right. As much plus dinner. <laughs> well, and if we think for a minute about Mr. Raya as his, he's the the uh, manager of Posby and Company, although he's not the principal of it, uh, but he's also a tutor, mm -hmm. um, teaching teaching literacy, fluent slash fluency, uh, to Lizzie and to Jenny as they uh, begin to learn to read. And Jenny's most Jenny's most interesting comment is that as she as she cries, "Come up and be dead, come up and be dead to the world." As we learn to read, as we learn something else, we learn we uh, transcend or escape. Not quite the same. Uh, the situation we're in as we uh, as we learn something else. It's so interesting that they that that that's even a scene. That that's even a thing. That these two. Right. Poor girls uh, somehow get it in their minds that they uh, do want to do this, and with um, uh, a Jewish man who right. uh, letters, and and that it's a a a private lesson sort of thing. I mean, you know, you you can imagine how that might have come about. You know, with with. Um, 
conversations or ideas or you know or was it so fantastical was it so new was it so oh well of course you know the boys are, are in school and you know we want a little bit of of that too maybe we'll um have some well and, and eugene too. wants to give her something that is well and make her independent yes and not something that necessarily doesn't quite say it this clearly that he wants to do something to make her independent so she can uh, perhaps find the secret of her life that he hasn't found for his you know riddle me riddle me riddle me read said i have no idea what i'm going to be but he wants to do that practical thing for her and which it, also sorry uh, uh -huh. then has the the uh, result of raising her up yes. in, in status that you know if if there were to be a coupling in the future you know as much as he's falling in love with her and you know it's still there is still a great chasm between mm -hmm. them and you know you know money can be be gotten easily in life but um but uh, literacy is really where it's at so right that 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 that's the the only remaining thing that is the barrier between them you know it's not necessarily attraction or looks or official social standing or um, background it's the literacy and 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 that she is willing to do it because she sees that it's um useful for her and interesting and yeah hmm. right. and she's already fluent in the river she's already fluent in some other things too but it's that that sense of that literacy that she she needs right uh, Ledgeby and Lamel are good readers aren't they of social situations mm. mm -hmm. They have a, a, that may be more fluency than literacy, but they know how to read a situation. They know how to uh, remember the scene in book one where he is instructing Sophronia without even speaking to her. He comes to touch her, a, a bracelet she has on her hand and she is looking very clearly at him. And he's basically instructing her what to do next um, to get the situation uh, going for her. Very, very interesting. Hmm. And then, of course, Headstone, I didn't put him on here because uh, what he's teaching may not be quite uh, quite literacy uh, in what he wants to, to help uh, Jenny and Lizzie. Well, it's Lizzie only. He's not interested in helping Jenny. Well, he's, he's, he's teaching school every day, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, Liam. Yeah, Liam, you were starting to say something? No, no, just agreeing with the person who, who spoke. Mm -hmm. Somebody okay. said you teach in school every day. Was that, was that Heidi? You said that. Yes. Hello. <laughs> okay. okay. We, can, we can talk about picking the dust next time because we will have had more opportunity, but we really almost already talked about this with Jenny picking up scraps. Um, um, the uh, the people who make their their living out of um, Rogue Riderhood's daughter has the has the what is she calls it Le left leftovers the shop leaving business what is it a a leaving business leaving maybe? business right the leaving business a people of left broker yeah. And oh, um, pawnbroker for a girl. <laughs> yes, right, right. And we haven't really gotten to see too much of Mr. Venus yet, but he certainly is uh, picking the bones, picking the, the, the pieces of things. And I think we can leave designing, although we are, we're kind of looking, looking at that designing. So let me uh, get us to um, our last. Next time, let's talk about some quotations that you pick out. Um, so I thought we would listen to the language 
This is a doctor who is fluent and uh, he's literate in language, the language of illness and fluent in the language of children. The doctor was quick to understand children and taking the horse, the ark, the yellow bird and the man and the guards from John's bed softly placed them on that of his next neighbor, the mite with the broken hip. He understands what Johnny wants done. Him, he says, him, and the doctor knows. Uh, and this is Bella talking about herself. If there ever was a mercenary plotter whose thoughts and designs were always in her mean occupation, I am the amiable, I'm the amiable creature and I don't care. I hate and detest being poor. If I can, that should be marry money, if I can marry money. Can you think of another character who may have felt that way but made the wrong choice? Sephronia. Yes, right, yeah, yeah. But those are such different, can I say? <clears throat> yes, yeah. The, the, there's, I mean, one is about exploitation, and the right. other is about uh, true projection into the into the view of another person. And yeah. that, those seem to be so contrary to me. And that, this goes back to literacy. I think those people, Fledgeby and Lamley, I think they're very bad readers. They're good at exploiting. They can, you know, yeah. see the detail and see how they can use it. But the, you know, to truly understand, and there's a passage I cannot find, I can't find anything in this novel <laughs> um, about feeling, about how you can't read and let you feel and make it up, or is it somewhere in, does it sound familiar to anybody? There's something about, I mean, because of course, Headstone's a terrible reader and Charlie yeah. is, a, you know, yeah. they learn how to, they learn the mechanics of it. But they don't understand anything about other people or about themselves um, because the feeling is missing. And I think there's some passage somewhere in the, in the novel that suggests that. Um, because I was disappointed about this. I, at first, I thought, ah, literacy, yes, the way to a better life. But then you see it's not. I mean, particularly with Headstone, it's, it's just a travesty. I mean, he and Charlie, who becomes, the, you know, uh, scoundrel and and also Weg, who I don't really think much of. I mean, he's simply an exploiter um, who doesn't really know how to read at all. It's, it's come up. What's <laughs> anyway? That's and these two seem very. These two passages you've uh, selected seem very opposite in terms of yes, readership. Uh, you know. Mark, Mark. Mark. I don't think I have another one there. Oh yes, here's another one. And we can end with this because this will take us on into the into the next time. I a lady, I a poor girl who used to row poor father on the river. I who had rowed poor father out and home on the very night when I saw him for the first time. I who was made so timid by his looking at me that I got up and went out. Lizzie. Lizzie. Yes, that's Lizzie, right. And here she's trying to, she's one of the aspects of both fluency and literacy is defining terms, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this whole business of who's the lady and who's not mm -hmm. uh, becomes important as the book takes us toward the end. It's in the very last, last book. But uh, uh, I wrote poor father out and home on the very night when I saw him for the first time. That's when she's seen Eugene Graeber looking at her because they've discovered that Gaffer Hexham is, is actually dead. So, you know, one of the fun things about reading Dickens are is the, the chance to sit and look at a few lines of text and to be really astonished by what's there in a few words. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a, a very astonishing. Well, whether we like it or not, we have succumbed to the end of our, our
discussion. Again, I thank you so much for your life, your good, your thinking ahead, and your lively participation in the in the and your and your good fluency and reading uh, as we're <laughs> as we're dealing with the novel. I appreciate that. That's one of the fun things of being around the Kinseyans is how well that how well they read the the book, how well they are fluent in the history, and how well we can can uh, uh, combine those two skills. So we're going to look at some quotes, and I think um, we, you'll get some instructions on how to get them ready for uh, into a collection. I'm promising something that I'm not going to do, but I think we'll get it done so that you, we can have some quotations. And these can be from any one of the three books that just you found interesting. Some of them, you think, I have no idea what this means, so we can talk about that too. Uh, but fairly short ones like this, okay? Okay. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. It is awesome.